Howdy folks and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Today we'll be focusing on Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30, the first game in a long series that up until this point had been completely obscured in time for myself. Now, if you grew up in the 2000s like me, there were a lot of cultural niches. Remember, this was before widespread internet. What was popular usually was copied. For example, media surrounding World War II became increasingly available. From movies like Saving Private Ryan, to games like Medal of Honor and Call of Duty, World War II was a hot topic over a decade, until, like anything popular, became oversaturated and replaced by the next topic. But before that oversaturation, there were some games from that era that truly were unique and well done. My first foray into this genre was Medal of Honor Rising Sun on the GameCube. I can distinctly remember the game coming in two discs. There was something so rough and endearing about the characters portrayed in the game, especially knowing that they were based on real stories and people. Of course, embellishment and entertainment skew the events, and I understand these are video games. I also understand that you can view these games as historical preservation. These soldiers' stories are now able to be told forever. Even Call of Duty 2, which is much more of an action game, had their levels elevated by the stories they told. And yes, we must talk about Call of Duty 2 briefly before Brothers in Arms. Call of Duty 2 came out 8 months after Brothers in Arms, which I found interesting. I had only seen Brothers in Arms advertised in Game Informer or PC Gamer magazine, but I would have sworn that COD 2 came out before and took the spotlight. Call of Duty 2 sold 6 million copies in its entirety, which is a staggering number considering it was mostly physical discs. Now, having played both games, neither one is better, but I am surprised that Brothers in Arms doesn't have the same name recognition as the COD series, even before the transition to Modern Warfare. I was surprised by the imbalance because while playing Brothers in Arms Road to Hill 30, I was blown away by its unique gameplay and interesting storytelling. This is not some run-and-gun shooter, and learning the new mechanics and getting better executing them was a progression that I did not expect. You play as Sergeant Baker, a soldier in the airborne about to jump behind enemy lines. Already I was excited for something different than storming the beach. This was a great way of starting the game and knowing the horrors the airborne encountered in the first days after D-Day, I knew I was in for hell. I love the way they start each level with Sergeant Baker talking to himself. Two families, those you raise, and those you raise hell with. I've spent eight days here. Eight days commanding a squad I wasn't ready to lead. Eight days watching my men, my family, kill and be killed. Eight days wishing it would stop. It gives a good insight into his thinking, and the voice actor nails the evolution of a person's voice after each atrocity they see. For direction, I was not expecting this cinematic style, which I was very happy about. You want me? Lucky, take me! Take me! I also enjoyed that they don't give you a lot of information at the start. It worked in a gameplay sense and also a story sense. You do feel like you've just woken up from shell shock and have no idea what's going on. Remember when I said it's not a run and gun game? So I had to look this up, but the game artificially negates your accuracy even when you're not moving. What they want you to accomplish is using flanking and other tactical plans rather than charging head on. The problem with that arises in the very first mission, where you are in cover and you still can't hit things accurately, which gets a little frustrating. Anyways, it's a small gripe and we continue on with this jarring scene. If this reminds you of Band of Brothers, you're spot on. 
The director of the game even said they wanted to distinguish itself from other franchises. So they painstakingly recreated the actual look of 1944 Normandy and its buildings, landmarks, streets, and battlefields. They researched real soldiers who fought there, the historical reconnaissance photography, and operations and battles such as Operation XYZ, Utah Beach, and Purple Heart Lane. The developer's research included interviewing various veterans and shooting the actual weapons from the game's timeline. All of these things took years of work, and the game went through many different prototypes. It's hard for developers nowadays to focus this much time and dedication on a game like this. It makes me sad because I think there's so much more that can be done now that wasn't possible in 2005. One of those things that I chuckled at is that this game runs on Unreal 2.0, and seeing what's coming out now in Unreal 5.0, I think some old stories need a modern telling. The way Baker talks about being in charge of his squad is haunting. I never asked to be squad leader, but I had no choice. Now I've got 13 soldiers under my command. 13 men depending on me to make the right decisions and not get them killed. 13 families relying on me to bring their husbands and sons home. 13. 13 is not a lucky number. Even the superstitious number had me questioning things, and I don't subscribe to that kind of stuff. This was intense, and the direction was perfectly executed. I couldn't imagine being 22 years old and jumping out of a plane, let alone leading a squad of soldiers. We land somewhere in the dark of France and quickly complete our movement tutorial. We meet up with Sergeant Mack and get the classic American pistol. Oh shit. Take my 45 and shoot anything that's wearing gray. Ah, nothing better than killing Nazis. We find some other airborne troops and try to figure out where we really are. I enjoyed the scene and then I started to realize, oh no, are they going to make me care for them? Games like Call of Duty, you don't think about the random AIs getting mowed down. But oh boy, in Brothers in Arms, having your squad mates killed is heart-wrenching because they build the characters so well. Americans, what town is this? Any of y'all know French? Oh, New dear, oh no song. Uh, she says we're just northeast of St. Mary Glees. Damn it! Well, we're heading the wrong direction. I'm gonna see if I can gather some more guys. Y'all head that way, through the gate, and link up with anyone else you find as you head east. You can consider each level like a small vignette. Each tell a small story and have a unique layout that lends itself to one of the game's core mechanics. The squad system. You are a squad leader and your choices have ramifications for your enemies and for your own soldiers. I really enjoyed this more slow approach to fighting in World War II. I had been used to running around with a PPSH and COD bursting people down and then taking cover to heal. Brothers in Arms makes you take each fight strategically or you will be killed a lot. Even playing on easy mode, I died so many times. Some of it was greatly justified, and as I was saying, you send your troops to a position without knowing there was an MG-42 down that same road, well, they're all dead. Then there were other times, and we'll get to that. Anyways, the game does a great job with its pacing, having a good fight and then laying some story down. Hearing one of the soldiers exclaiming to the sergeant about trying to help a down plane is well done. Poor bastards. We should help them. Maybe there's still some alive. What do we do? There's nothing we can do. But Sarge, keep moving, Leggett. The voice acting in this game is maybe 90% well done. 
There were some times where I really questioned how this got through, but I was so immersed by most of the voices that it outweighed any other thoughts on the matter. We continue on and blow up an AA gun. I enjoyed the level design and there was ample cover and good flanking routes. The game also tells you at some point that there isn't a direct path to your objective. I would love to see this expanded on in a modern game engine. Knowing how big and detailed maps can get, especially with squad mechanics involved, could be a great way to get the series back in the spotlight. I do love these short stories, but I would have loved to see a map showing our progression each level. These places are real and the developers took so much time detailing them. I just never felt oriented. Maybe that was the point? I don't know. What are your thoughts? The next mission is during D-Day and I love this change of perspective. I got word from another platoon that some of our boys dropped in this area. Crowds were nice enough to flood it for us as a welcoming gift. Sure as shit isn't going to be easy finding them out here. Unless, of course, they find us. Is that red? This crowd's all over. I think I saw a mortar team just back there. Jesus, it's great to see you guys. I spent this morning in a ditch full of water, but I got one. Picked him off as he sipped his morning joe. Also, if I was playing Steel Division 2 and had my back lines compromised by thousands of airborne troops, I'd be livid. We get to command our first real squad, and I had no idea what I was doing at this point. I will say that by the end of the game, I did feel like a commander, which was a great experience. Walking around the now somewhat sunny French countryside, you can see how detailed the art style and the designs are. As I mentioned before, the dev team went through so many references about the area, and it feels like it. Again, the cinematic effort put into this was immense and well worth it. Personally, if I had dropped in and got back to the beachhead, I don't think I would want to go back east. I don't know, these kids, what they did, it's exceptional. And some of these soldiers really are kids, and you can tell from their dialogue, which was really well written. It amazes me that something so beautiful could be part of something so ugly. The best levels in the game are the ones that are most open. Having multiple routes and deciding how to send your troops kept the game interesting and engaging. I lost a lot of men, and there were some obvious do not go down that street areas. I also enjoyed this little Chekhov's gun moment. We heard one of our boys asking what the krauts eat, and then we get to see... They eat lead. I was not expecting this and was pleasantly surprised by the calm brutality of it all. Sort of like in Saving Private Ryan when they shoot the Czech soldiers who are actually surrendering. Something powerfully off-putting. This level had a great final fight. Assaulting the farmhouse, sadly some of the AI just ran out of their cover which was weird, but I still enjoyed it. We also got some official US Army property. The keys are still in it. I say this Opal Blitz just became official U.S. Army property. What do you think, Mac? I think I'm driving. <laughs> Familiar faces. Makes a place like this almost feel like home. Almost. Sometimes I forget Alan and Garnett are two people. They showed up at Fort Bragg together and no one has seen them apart since. We just started saying Alan and Garnett like it was one word. Even with the damn mist drops, they still managed to stay together. Oh God, Alan and Garnett. We continue on and fight through a petit village, encountering loads of German soldiers and an MG gun. 
Now, see how this MG gun shoots three times and I don't die until the third? Amazing. As it should be. Unfortunately, there are points to this game where you will be instantly killed either by an MG or a tank. Now, you're of course saying, you get shot by a tank or a machine gun, you're probably dead, and I agree with you. But the game goes half and half when it comes to this, and at certain points the AI feels generally balanced, almost to the point of being easy. Then there are times that I felt like I was playing Escape from Tarkov. We'll get to that moment later. Anyways, I love the suppress mechanics, it was a lot of fun engaging enemies with the MG42 while sending my squad to flank their positions. The game always gives you the chance to play strategically, which you almost always have to. After defending the church and going after a pesky mortar team, we're tasked with taking down poles in the fields. I love the line, Clear out as many of those damn things as you can! You know, he has a nasty habit of making this shit sound easy. This is just crazy conceptually. I couldn't find a lot of specifics on the topic, so if any history buffs want to put in the comments what this operation was based on, I would really appreciate it. I enjoyed this level because of the openness and having to use the cover that's there efficiently. I had to restart this level a lot though. We somehow clear the field without losing my whole squad and get to talk to one of the flyboys. I'm surprised this guy wasn't the trope of the Brooklyn person. Hey, I was walking here. Back in Brooklyn, you take the cue to 7th Ave. I figured I'd get skewered for sure. Hey, you with the 502nd, right? I'm supposed to resupply you guys. I got plenty of ammo inside. Take whatever you need. After our field heroics, we get our chance at commanding a tank squad. I enjoyed the tanks, and again, having this mechanic in a modern game would be interesting to see. Matt, just tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. Consider me part of the squad. One downside of having tanks in these levels was the movement. There were multiple times where my tanks would get stuck on geometry or not know how to path themselves to a destination. Luckily, this wasn't the worst thing, and the power they brought to the battlefield certainly outweighed these annoying moments. We defend another church, and I know it seems repetitive, and it kind of is. Yet, hearing Baker talk about his friend, the one that just saved our sorry asses in the Sherman, felt true. George and I sat on the back of his tank and talked for an hour about home over a K-ration. For once, it didn't taste like paste in a can. It's the weirdest feeling being at war with your best friend there. You feel almost invincible. Like nothing can stop you from driving all the way to Berlin and winning that ticket home. That's another topic I found interesting when researching the game. Although it got lots of good reviews, there was a baseline of reviewers that thought the gameplay was too repetitive. I completely understand. But I did think there was enough variation in the level design and immersion through character development that terming it repetitive never really crossed my mind. We continue on with our tank friend and wreck havoc on the German back lines. Again, if you're not using the game's mechanics, you will die. Finding the right balance of attacking, suppressing, and flanking was always exhilarating. Oh, right there? Did you see it? I call this the Tarkov special. Up until this point, the MG42s have given you a little time to get back into the cover. Now there is a 50-50 chance that they just one-shot you. A trope of 2000s gaming for me was the atrocious checkpoint systems. I understand hardware limitations, but there were some points in this game where I physically wanted to punch a wall after the game respawned me 20 minutes back. I kid you not, there was one level where they just put you at the start, even though you fought legitimately eight squads. Okay, take a breath, war is hell, war is hell, take a breath. We continue on and thankfully we see what I believe to be the only supply crate in the game. I seriously was confused after this point, because there was multiple times I found myself without ammo and desperately searching for one of these crates to no avail. I 
I'm gonna have to shove through it. Oh my god, of course he was going to die. I enjoyed how Sergeant Mack responds to this. The first thing he says is to think about this later. Man, hearing Baker after the aftermath of just seeing his friend torched is brutal. For an hour, and pretended I was asleep. I spent most of the night trying to figure out what I'd say to George's mom when I saw her again. He died a hero. He died for the man next to him. But he's gone, and I'll never see him again. I'll never see George again. Day three. Your squad mates sound genuinely sorry, and you can hear their cadence change. Hey, Baker. Mac needed to talk to you. It sounded important. It's just a shitty deal. Well, in war... Everybody gets a shitty deal. I weirdly found myself feeling like I was in Half-Life 2 with the way they allowed the player to be the director with the camera and movement control. They have these static animations that you decide on what to look at. It was a good choice. At this point, I was feeling much more comfortable commanding my troops and also being agile myself. This was great and I was amazed by how good the squad AI could be. I have to replay Republic Commando now since they utilize similar squad-based gameplay, which I seem to really enjoy. As I said before, commanding tanks is fun, but for the next mission, fighting against a tank without support was horrifying. Seeing this panzer coming into the town square and not knowing how to take it down was enthralling. With waves of enemies coming in and needing to take out the panzer as well, it was a set piece I'll remember for a while. It might actually be one of the highest points of the game. Sadly, we're also coming to my personal low point of the game. Welcome to Buying the Farm. Oh my god, where do I even start with this? They even make fun of you knowing that this level is complete and That's utter it? BS. Well, I'm sure the bloodthirsty Nazis will just walk out and hand it to us if we ask them nicely enough. Well, what if we say please? Do you guys ever stop? Only when you take breaths in between all your whining. But why is it BS? The beginning is actually decent. You have to leave your tank back to cover your initial assault. If you send it in, the Nazis have an anti-tank gun hidden that will destroy it. It's a great balancing act of sending armor, then troops, or vice versa. However, the problem came from this machine gun. I cannot tell you how angry this made me. At no point has the game made a clear-cut message about whether you're going to survive a certain area or not. When I first approached this position, I thought I could use the tank as cover. Wrong. You take one step out and you're toast. I tried to set the tank to assault the position, which was the right thing to do. But as I said before, tanks get stuck on geometry a lot, and I didn't realize that. So what transpired for me was dying about 15 times thinking I had to do something else than just send my tank in to destroy the nest. The quickness of this MG to shoot you was maybe beyond Tarkov's bosses. I mean, instantly head-eyesed. Finally, my order to the tank worked, and even though losing almost all my squad, we finally managed to get through this level. I cannot give this moment true justice in how annoying and frustrating it was. Now, in retrospect, it's hilarious. If you're playing this game and something isn't working, it's probably the game and not you. I kid you not, I spent 45 minutes at this one spot. We thankfully continue on and Sergeant Baker learns that he can ride tanks. 
I wasn't expecting to be able to do this, and I enjoyed being able to give suppressing fire to my squad mates. One thing I was kind of confused about was the ability to go into third person while on a turret. It didn't really make sense gameplay wise, and there was no real way that you could even aim while in that camera perspective. Now, we get one of the funniest moments in the game, the crash. During a certain level, you'll have to cross a bridge and destroy it from the other side. After enduring whatever buying the farm was, I was not so keen on spending a lot more time in the game that day, so when noticing I could press F for the charges, skipping killing all the enemies, I instantly did so. And then this happened. I was confused at first, so I tried again doing the same strategy, and lo and behold, another crash. I did the normal check the files, restart, but nothing was amiss, so I thought as a developer, why would it be crashing? And then I realized it. The game wants all your soldiers to get to the other side before the detonation. They wanted this so much that they did not even add a scene or an explanation for this. They just crash your game and you have to figure it out. I was laughing so much at this notion, like what happened on consoles that couldn't quit to desktop? Did they really just put in a script to crash the game if X and Y didn't get past Z? I don't know if this is truly the answer, but it's the only thing that makes sense to me. If you have any thoughts on the matter, please let me know. Survive. I ran faster than I ever ran in my life, and I was carrying 30 pounds of gear. Somehow your brain starts to rationalize. Just get down this road, Matt Baker. Just get down this road and you'll be going home. It's only once you stop running that you start to wonder. Will any of us actually return home? Alive? We get past the crash bridge and get the best weapon in the game, the sniper rifle. The sniper rifle is the best gun in the game because it actually shoots accurately. A novel concept, I know. This was a great level and using the sniper felt powerful. Getting headshots at distance felt rewarding and being able to rush a single target after decimating his other squad mates felt satisfying. We get past the swamps and oh boy, I don't really understand what this bridge was, but that's some gnarly gore. Take it easy, you've been out for a while. Doesn't make sense. Doesn't make any goddamn sense. We gotta go, Red. Red. We gotta go. This was a great scene, charging under the cover of smoke. Oh, gosh darn it. We destroyed the rest of the German defenses and quickly got told we're needed to help out another squad leader, Combs. Combs is safe, but we need to defend against another German assault. I enjoyed this arena and used the cover to my full advantage. As we're closing in on the end of the game, I couldn't help but remember the opening scene. How do we get there? Does it happen in Keratin? After? This was a crazy level due to its maze-like design and the anti-tank necessities. I swear, fighting tanks in this game scared me because your troops do not attack the tank at all, or I didn't witness them doing it. It was also a crazy level because, again, Tarkov MG42s. I had to look up how close I was to the end because at this point, I almost stopped finishing the game. Let's take the MG on the right. For four lives, five lives, I was able to run past it and flank it to take it out. But then, for some reason, it started one-shotting me every time. I had no idea why, and then the AI would somehow turn on their aimbot and absolutely wreck me. Again, I understand running past an MG is dangerous, but if I could survive five, six times before, and then it randomly starts one-shotting me, I don't understand. Even if the MG was suppressed, it didn't stop it from shooting, which is another mechanic that didn't work. Anyways, I had to take my dog out for a long walk after completing this level. It sounded like Baker needs one too. Oh, as we're making progress, 
The feeling of victory is being ebbed away by the faces of Musa, Garnett, Alan DeSole, and Rivas. And George. Is this it? Do we really take Carantan? Part of me just wishes the Germans would attack. Just so I can get these thoughts out of my head. I enjoyed the way they started this level. I got we'll Carpazzo vibes from Saving Private Ryan. Being the sniper in the church tower was a lot of fun, and one of those World War II tropes that I never got tired of. Europe has a lot of churches, and they're the tallest points in the villages. It makes sense. Anyways, we defend against a heavy German assault. Having the bazooka was a lot of fun, and it ripped those panzers to shreds. Oh boy, remember this? Yeah, this is when the game really hit for me. I loved my experience with Brothers in Arms because it felt very unique to other World War II games, and this directorial choice solidified it. Hearing... Baker! You okay, Baker? I couldn't not tear up a little. Knowing that these are based on true stories and thinking about the courage and the strength it took to even get through eight days of this baffles me and will be something I will never truly understand. We have our final tank battle and of course the game wouldn't be complete without one more insta kill MG. We get our final cutscene and oh boy I felt heavy. Like at the ending of Band of Brothers. Why in the hell did you bring back that busted piece of crap? Not sure. Seemed like the right thing to do. What are you gonna do? Bury it? I might. Knock off the chatter and fall in! Now I'm not one for speeches, so I'll make this short. First, there's a Colonel Marshall here to interview some of you for General Eisenhower. Don't screw that up! Second, I've been in the army a long time, and in some pretty good units. But in all that time, well, I just want to say you guys did good. Anyways, I love the fact that they seamlessly insinuate there will be a sequel. Grab your gear, troopers! We've still got a war to fight! Third squad, you heard the man. Move out! Which I'm very much looking forward to playing later on. I can't believe this game doesn't get the same amount of love as Call of Duty 2. Don't get me wrong, I love COD 2 and spent hundreds of hours with its single player and multiplayer. But Brothers in Arms is something different, something more substantial. Was it truly the rating of Mature that made Brothers in Arms less popular than the teen rated Call of Duty 2? I know ESRB ratings were almost non-negotiable with my parents, and that does lend itself to a lot more people buying the game. Anyways, Brothers in Arms is a testament to video games as a powerful tool for storytelling and historical preservation. The game has a fantastic extras tab that has real documentation from the Airborne, and an iconic picture of Eisenhower meeting with, I believe, the only squad before D-Day. In a time of misinformation and historical tampering, I think video games could be a source of true peer-reviewed historical material. With the advent of newer technologies, recreating battlefields or historical timelines would have tangible societal benefits. Going through historical documents and archives, finding genuine stories mixed into different gameplay variants could be a new renaissance in historical storytelling and video games in general. Brothers in Arms is something more than a video game. It's an experience, and I truly appreciate you sharing that with me. Let me know if you played this game back in the day and what your favorite from the series was. I'm excited to continue playing this franchise and I can't wait to see all the evolutions and changes the developers make. This is a strong base to build on. Thank you again for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a comment on your favorite World War II shooter, click that like button, and subscribe if you haven't. If you loved the video, I recommend checking out my channel. I'm sure there is something there for you. And as always, I'll see you next time. I never asked to be squad leader, but I had no choice. 
Now I've got 13 soldiers under my command. 13 men depending on me to make the right decisions and not get them killed. 13 families relying on me to bring their husbands and sons home. 13. 13 is not a lucky number. <laughs> 